Hey, you knuckleheads, thanks for joining us. We're here at Carver's Field this morning, and uh, we had a great day of flying. I think you made your first flight. Yep. Jake made his first flight. Pops made his first flight. These two guys are in from Utah. We had a great time. In fact, if you want to come in for a second and just kind of introduce yourself, go ahead and tell you who you are and what your flight was like. I'm Jake Horton from Ogden, Utah. <laughs> My flight was amazing. I heard him screaming up there, <laughs> even before he asked him to give me a big e to let him know I could hear him. That was nice. Good landing. Pops, what do you think about it? Well, I muffed up more than anybody. It took me four tries to get up, but once I got up there, it was just like being home. <laughs> it was so good. It, it, it really was awesome. He, you know, and we don't, uh, uh, when, when we have a, a failed launch, man, that's a good thing, actually. Uh, if everything goes too perfect, nobody learns anything. Smooth seas don't make good sailors. So we actually like, uh, and it's nice to have a group, uh, because when you're in the cockpit and you're flying, uh, people see it from a different perspective when we're out here and they can see when somebody else and they see me correcting them It's actually a good thing to have some things happen. He had four mishaps and uh, I don't like to look at them as You know, you know a failed launch is actually it's the best learning tool <laughs> Like I said if everything goes smooth it's, you just don't learn anything because it's, it's nothing there My setups usually work good. Uh, they work about 99% of the time But sometimes little things like the wind has been changing a little bit here just a little bit. We've tried to fly in almost dead air when we're flying the trikes, but even the slightest wind, you saw just a little bit of any change in that diversion. You see how that wing wants to get over into it. And when your skill level is low, you just, uh, it's better just to shut it off and do a reset. Uh, Cause then you learn how to reset it. You learn how, how picky that wing wants to be with getting those three things lined for a good launch. The wind, the, the pilot and the center of the wing. And uh, we, uh, you made your first flight. He's going to be going tonight. He had a tangle in his lines. We're going to be doing a video on that. We keep talking about it, but we haven't got it out yet on how to detangle your lines. And the last time he put it away, kind of kind of grouped it up. So the, it started getting a little funky up there. So he's going to fly tonight. He's going to be our first guy tonight. But go ahead and tell him who you are. And uh, I'm Jeff Adams from Knoxville, Tennessee. And this is fun. What'd you think of that flight while you're up there? That well, was great. Just getting up was the hard part. A little, little puckered. <laughs> well, you know, you gotta, you gotta listen to your instructor. You can't panic and get off the things. And I did that a couple times. That's so. all right. But we did good. Every everybody had a great flight this morning. All the landings were good. Uh, nice and smooth. Nice laydowns with the wings. Nothing. Uh, no. Uh, no. No carnage or anything today. Bring that camera in here today. I want to talk about a question uh, that I always get asked every time somebody calls in when they're buying equipment or when they first come into the sport. Uh, they say, what about a reserve? What about a reserve? And, uh, you know, I, I got some opinions on it, and I'm going to tell you what I think they are. Um, first of all, I've never had a collapse on a glider in almost 30 years of doing this. And probably over 30,000 hours of doing this, I've never had a collapse on a glider. And the reason for that is, is because I don't do aerobatics beyond my skill level, and I don't fly, the primary reason is I don't fly in weather conditions that the wing can't handle and when you're watching YouTube and you people coming into the sport you're gonna watch all sorts of crashes and things like that because that's what gets the attention on that YouTube it makes people want to click on it and you can just about type in anything skateboarding accident jet skiing accident water skiing accident uh, people for some reason we like to watch that kind of stuff but people coming into the sport think oh my god that wings gonna fold up anytime it's hard to have a collapse so when you watch these guys getting collapse on collapses on their wings, and they're flying and they're on and they're on uh, uh, on YouTube and their stuff, there really is no way for me to sugarcoat this. Okay, I'm going to tell you this right now: they're idiots. That's all there is to it. They're being an idiot. They're flying in conditions that they shouldn't be flying in. Maybe their urge to fly override their intelligence for a day, but sooner or later that stuff's going to bite you. If you don't fly midday, you won't get a collapse. They start these things called the Icarus race, which I think is kind of a dumb name for it. If you read the story of Icarus, it didn't end well. Uh, so why you would call it an Icarus race and want to want to get involved in something that promotes you winning and staying flying to beat everybody else and fly in conditions you shouldn't be flying in, well, then you're just an idiot. Win it all you want. You can have your trophy. Go ahead and do it. I like coming home to my wife every night. I like talking to my kids. I got a granddaughter I want to be around for, and I'm not going to risk it. There's always another better day to fly, and I could care less about a little plastic trophy that says, I won. Uh, so if you want to be an idiot and fly in conditions you shouldn't have, expect collapses. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, and it will bite you. Now, 
in, in paragliding, everybody flies with a reserve. In fact, some of my friends and some of my students have become uh, champion paraglider pilots. I think of Britton Shaw, uh, who I trained years ago, he became an instructor, and then he became a, uh, a, a, a you know, he's, he set some records in, in paragliding. You will get collapses. You can ask any paraglider pilot, have you ever had a collapse? And they will say yes. And if they tell you no, they're lying to you. Okay? Collapses are not fun, which is why they fly with a reserve. They're flying in dir dirty thermal air. They need that air for the lift. We don't. We have our own thermal right here. Okay? We can pick and choose the day we fly in, and there's no reason for us to have a collapse. And again, in almost 30 years of doing this, I have never, ever had a collapse on a glider. So if you get one, you were being stupid. And I'll say the same thing about myself. If I get one, I was being stupid. And so the people ask me all the time, should I get a reserve? Now, when I, when I sell equipment to people, I really like to put them into a beginner to intermediate glider, a mid-range wing. And quite honestly, unless you're gonna be competing in national aerobatic championships where speed and every second counts and doing pylons and doing aerobatics, you honestly never ever need to leave your beginner to intermediate glider. I can take a total beginner wing and do insane aerobatics on it. It's really the Indian, not the arrow. So, I mean, you could put Tony Hawk, a uh, skateboarder expert, on a, on a Walmart skateboard and you can give a kid that's been competing for a long time but maybe not at the same level as Tony and put him on a $1,500 skateboard, Tony's still going to out, out, out skateboard him. So you can take a beginner wing and still do all the things you want to do, but I like to put a beginner to intermediate. And the reason a beginner to intermediate is because they're very safe, they're very stable. I sell two wings that I've narrowed it down to that I like. There's hundreds of wings out there. Some are launching easier. Uh, there's a lot of great wings. There's also a lot of crappy ones out there too. Um, I, I've narrowed it down to two of them and uh, I really like these two companies that I sell. And it's the Adele Power Atlas. I love this wing. It's been redesigned five times. A lot of people will tell you that's an old technology wing. It's not. It was designed by Jin. He's a famous wing designer, has his own line. And he designed the Power Atlas, and it's been redesigned five times. And the thing launches easy. It's stable. Very resistant to collapsing. A beginner to intermediate glider is very resistant to collapsing. But if you are ever stupid enough to fly in conditions you shouldn't, it will reinflate if you had a collapse. If you can remember to put your hands at your ears, it will reinflate faster than you could probably tip your head and look up at it. It's already flying again. There are guys that try to make videos of trying to purposely make their wing collapse so you'll click on their videos. Although I think this is a stupid idea to do that, um, they still have a hard time of even trying to purposely make them collapse. So a collapse is not easy to do. But if you fly in weather conditions where thermals are on and you start flying in the midday, the ground is being heated up, air is lifting, and all the air around it is sinking. So the wing is flying through that. It has no struts, you have lines. This is not an airplane. So it can wrap up a wing and roll up a wing. And again, paraglider pilots get this all the time. But with a beginner to intermediate glider, it would reinflate faster than you could realize you had a collapse, reach for the reserve, grab the reserve, pull the reserve, throw the reserve, have the reserve deploy, blossom out, your other wing's already fixed. On a good beginner to intermediate glider, it will reinflate itself with the dumbest pilot hanging from it. That's what you want to be in. And, and I still fly my beginner to intermediate glider 99% of the time. We do have a high performance uh, reflex glider called the Ramaflex that we sell. I fly that occasionally, uh, but honestly, I can do the same things and, and, and maybe not as quick, uh, but I can do all the aerobatics that I want to do, trike or foot launch on my beginner to intermediate gliders and I can do absolutely everything from insane high G spiral dives, death spirals, insane wing overs, I can do 180 reversals and it just holds stable throughout the uh, things. I was doing some, uh, some aerobatics the other day for you guys. I mean getting on it and cranking it, you were there for that? Yep. And uh, did that wing ever even show a slight bit of tip fold or anything? Nope. And I mean, how did I have that wing? I had it going this way, around, every way, and, uh, and nothing. And so I kind of do that when students come in. I'll, if I get a day, I'll just throw on some aerobatics so they can see. And the main reason I'm showing them that is not to show off or anything, because I make very little uh, 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 videos of me flying, uh, because I don't want people to do what I do. I don't want them to think they can just jump in this thing and fly. You need to take this thing in baby steps. And we're all about safety here, which is why we train free of charge. Uh, we don't charge for that. It really pisses off 
a lot of my competitors that I train for free. They don't want you to know about that. They want to get that 3500 bucks out of your pocket, try to make you think you need a rating, and join their 11-month program and get more money out of you. So they don't like me too much. Here's a father and a son here. Okay, they would have paid $7,000 anywhere else for training, $3,500 a person, and they would have got seven to 10 days of training. These guys can come in until I'm dead and take more training, take a brush-up course, take advanced training, switch to tandem. They can do anything they want. If they want a foot launch. They have an unlimited VIP pass to unlimited training. They already saved seven grand by coming to Flight Junkies. So anyways, I was talking about that reserve. I purposely don't care for one because I don't need one. I feel like if I tell a guy he needs a reserve, I honestly feel so strong about it that I actually feel like I'm stealing his money. I actually try to talk him out of it. Think about this. I can make more money if I play off of his fears like the other instructors do they oh god yeah you need a you definitely want a reserve you definitely want one oh yeah and of course that guy he falls for all of that you honestly don't need one and you also the most of the people are flying at a couple hundred feet you almost don't have enough time to throw a reserve because they say oh a reserve will open in a hundred feet well yeah that's when they know that they're going to purposely have a collapse or they throw it out to see how fast it deploys but there's this human factor of when it's reality you know what I'm saying? That all, all of a sudden you had a collapse, there's still that slow reaction time and the human factor of pausing, freaking a little bit, grabbing, then throwing, but by that time you've burned up some air and you're hitting the ground. The best thing to do, don't fly in crappy weather. Pick another day to fly. And if you do have one and a good beginner to intermediate glider, you honestly don't need one. The drawback I think to having a reserve on, uh, uh, and again, I'm not totally opposed to it, but I will say this, and my students who are out there that ended up getting one, and they all can tell you this, there are a lot of people, I would say probably to the number of about seven to 10 people that I know, out of seven out of 10 people, I would say it's at least seven of them have had an accidental deployment, and a lot of times on takeoff, they bump the handle, something gets caught on it, and they deploy their parachute while their glider is flying. And there's a difference. The parachute is a parachute. The wing or the glider is a glider. The one comes straight down, the other one glides. And to have two of them out at the same time is counteractive, all right? So it's not good and you usually get slammed to the ground. Uh, and I know people that have done this and I said, man, you don't need one. Anyone had to got one anyways. And he was foot launching a guy named Mark, uh, one of my first students in, in the beginning. And uh, it was one of the first times I seen that the reserve deployed. And then it would happen a few other times. And so you always run a risk of that accidental deployment. You want to be checking that all the time to make sure that it doesn't. I'm not totally against the reserve, but honestly, I don't feel that you need one if you just use good judgment and don't fly on a day when, you know, it's starting to get a little froggy out. Check your weather. See the trees aren't moving. Fly in good weather. And if it's gusty, if you're a foot launcher, pre-cut your wing. Your wing will tell you everything that it's not good to fly. So if you see it change in direction and watch my pre-kiting video and make sure you subscribe to my channel, you'll get all of my other videos. In my videos, I don't just want to fly and, and, you know, do this and do that and, you know, fly to McDonald's and go here and go there. I want you to learn something from mine. So a lot of mine are teaching. We have some other nonsense ones like when Jill just jumped off the, off the, uh, uh, off the uh, stratosphere we're out in Vegas, something that doesn't have anything to do with flying. But most of my videos, if you subscribe to my channel, will teach you a technique. Teach, teach you something to keep you safe, uh, teach, you, teach you how to uh, save some time in your setup and just uh, be more efficient with everything that you're doing, whether you're foot launching or triking. You can watch those videos. But I hope this answers the question of do I need a reserve? And again, the choice is yours. I personally feel like I'm taking your money if, if I do. So if you use good judgment, you should never need one, ever. Again, one more time, I've never had a collapse in almost 30 years of doing this. So if you get one, you deserved it. You were, you were being stupid. That's all there is to it. And YouTube is full of stupidity. On and on and on. You can watch it all over the place. If you want to be safe, I've got 1,300. And what are we up to now? Who was 13? 1,333. 1,333. There's my 1,333 students. And so far, we have a flawless, perfect safety record. And my competitors can't argue with that. They can't argue with what I teach. And they can't argue with the, with the quality of our equipment. And I challenge them to bring in any piece of equipment that they think is better and I want to make a video of it because I haven't found anything better and I've owned and flown everything out there and I'm still a dealer for Fresh Breeze and if you got a technique 
or you think one of my techniques that you see in my other videos and you're a competitor of mine, you want to sit there and trash on flight junkies, remember our safety record and remember how many people we've trained. But if you've got something better, I'm willing to listen. Come in and show it to me. I want to see it. And uh, in our other video, we challenge you to do that. We want to know a better technique. But I think we got it pretty well figured out. We're going to stick with what we're doing. And the biggest thing that we're thankful for is that God has blessed us with a perfect safety record. And we do thank God for that because I believe there has been a lot of times we've had a lot of knuckleheads leave the ground here and I couldn't get in their ear even with a headset on. They start to panic. And I, I thank God for keeping them safe and bringing them down and everybody's here. So I can't take full credit for it. I like to thank my Heavenly Father for doing that. So amen for that. Thanks for joining me. We look forward to seeing you. And uh, come on out. Give us a call anytime and be sure to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for joining me.